Peace. It's your brother Kevin L. Two timelines. Today is 10-23-2021 and 8-17-76. Both reducing to two. All right. The alignment continues. The daily word for today in this month of Shamuel, 17th day, use your head or stop carrying it around with you. in my book, you know. <clears throat> Today I'm going to deal with full faith and credit. Alright. So you have a Certificate of live birth certificate, um, certificate authenticated, and they send it back to you. The Department of State sends it back to you with a gold ring. Right. Motorcycles going by. Let's go to the legal definition. Full faith and credit. The legal definition of full faith and credit is the recognition and enforcement of the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of one state by another. Compare choice of law, comedy, federalism. Note, unlike comedy, full faith and credit is a requirement created by who? The U.S. or what? the U.S. Constitution and the U.S. Code. A public law or a judicial decision may not, however, be entitled to full faith and credit for specific reasons as for having been decided by a court not having jurisdiction. Full faith and credit is given only in civil cases. States recognize each other's criminal laws through the mechanism of extradition. All right. So it is the recognition and enforcement of the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of one state by another. <clears throat> Let's check out the Constitution and where it is in the Constitution. But first, let's go to Free Legal Dictionary. I like to use all of these, you know what I mean, to get an understanding, especially this one because it gives you. A definition of each word in the definition. Dun, 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 dun. 
So, full faith and credit clause. What is it? Zoom this window up. Come. Shrink me down to, to the small corner right there. Yeah. Give me some zoom. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Full Faith and Credit Clause, Article 4, Section 1 of the United States Constitution provides that the various states must recognize legislative acts, public records, and judicial decisions of the other states within the United States. All right. It states that full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. All right? The statute that implements the clause, 28 U.S.C.A. Section 1738, further specifies that quote a state's preclusion rules should control matters originally litigated in that state end quote the full faith and credit clause ensures that judicial decisions rendered by the courts in one state are recognized and honored in every other state it also prevents parties from moving to another state to escape enforcement of a judgment or to relitigate a controversy already decided elsewhere. A practice known as forum shopping. All right? Forum shopping. In drafting the full faith and credit clause, the framers of the Constitution were motivated by a desire to unify their new country while preserving the autonomy of the states. To that end, they sought to guarantee that judgments rendered by the courts of one state would not be ignored by the courts of other states. The Supreme Court reiterated the framers intent when it held that the full faith and credit clause precluded any further litigation of a question previously decided by an Illinois court in Milwaukee County versus Emmy White Company 296 US 268 56 S C T two twenty nine eighty addition really need to learn these darn citations how to read citations if you're going to start dealing with it if you're going to deal with it you got to deal with it right the court held that by including the clause in the constitution the framers intended to make the states quote integral parts of a single nation throughout which a remedy upon a just obligation might be demanded as of right irrespective of the state of its origin End quote. integral parts of a single nation throughout which a remedy upon a just obligation might be demanded as of right irrespective of the state of its origin. The full faith and credit clause is invoked primarily to enforce judgments 
right? When a valid judgment is rendered by a court that has jurisdiction over the parties and the parties receive proper notice of the action and a reasonable opportunity to be heard, the full faith and credit clause requires that the judgment receive the same effect in other states as in the state where it is entered. A party who obtains a judgment in one state may petition the court in another state to enforce the judgment. When this is done, the parties do not relitigate the issues, and the court in the second state is obliged to fully recognize and honor the judgment of the first court in determining the enforceability of the judgment and the procedure for its execution. All these words got different meanings than you know I mean when we say it in normal parlance, when we normally talk in that shit. The full faith and credit clause has also been invoked to recognize the validity of a marriage right the full faith and credit clause has also been invoked to recognize the validity of a marriage traditionally every state honored a marriage legally contracted in another state however in 1993 the Hawaiian Supreme Court held that Hawaii statute restricting legal marriage to parties of the opposite sex establishes a sex-based classification which is subject to strict scrutiny if challenged on equal protection grounds Bear versus Lewin although the court did not recognize a constitutional right to same-sex marriage it raised the possibility that a successful equal protection challenge to the state's marriage laws could eventually lead to state sanctioned same-sex marriages in response to the bear case Congress in 1996 passed the defense of Marriage Act, the Defense of Marriage Act, one ten, well, yeah, one ten statute section two four one nine, which defines marriage as a union of a man and a woman for federal purposes and expressly grants states the right to refuse to recognize a same-sex marriage performed in another state right during the 1980s and 1990s the full faith and credit clause was applied to new matters child custody determinations had historically fallen under the jurisdiction of state courts child custody if you have something in custody you're a custodian custody child custody determinations had historically fallen under the jurisdiction of state courts and before the 1970s other states did not accord them full faith and credit enforcement as a result a divorced parent who was unhappy with one state's custody decision could sometimes obtain a more favorable ruling from another state this was an incentive for a dissatisfied parent to kidnap a child and move to another state in order to petition for custody petition for custody right 
all this business. In response to this situation, the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction Act was adopted by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws in 1968. By 1984, every state had adopted a version of the UCCJA. In 1980, Congress passed the Parental Kidnapping Prevention Act, 28 U.S.C.A. Section 1738A, which aids enforcement and promotes finality in child custody decisions by providing that valid custody decrees are entitled to full faith and credit enforcement in other states valid custody decrees are entitled to full faith and credit enforcement in other states then the violence against women act of 1994 public law number 103-322 codified in scattered sections of 8 USCA 18 USCA 42 USCA extends full faith and credit to the enforcement of protective orders which previously were not enforced except in the state where they were rendered this gave a new measure of protection to victims who moved to a different state after obtaining a protective order in one state. And they got the further readings. Right, but that's why I like this page. Or well, this site, the legal dictionary. Free dictionary. But that's full faith and credit according to that website and according to the Marion. Right? Now on the document that I have, my authenticated birth certificate or my authenticated certificate of live birth, it says... <clears throat> United States of America Department of State to all to whom these presents shall come greetings I certify that the document hereunto annexed let's look that up unto annexed annex annex not annex annex essential meaning of annex to add an area or region to a country state etc to take control of a territory or place. The United States annexed Texas in 1845. That's how it's used in a sentence. The government planned to annex the islands or add the islands or that area, that territory or take that territory. So I certify that the document here unto annexed or added is under the seal of the state states of Arizona and that such seal seals is are entitled to full faith and credit then it has an asterisk the asterisk note is 
for the contents of the annexed document or the added document or the added territory area or region annexed added to attach as a quality consequence or condition archaic to join together materially to add to something earlier larger or more important to incorporate a country or other territory within the domain of a state All right. for the contents of the annexed document the department assumes no responsibility this certificate is not valid if it is removed or altered in any way whatsoever In testimony whereof I, Rex W. Tillerson, who was the Secretary of State at that time, have hereunto caused the seal of the U. Uh, hereunto caused the seal of the Department of State to be affixed, and my name subscribed by the Assistant Authentication Officer of the said department at the city of Washington in the District of Columbia this 24th day of October 2017 and then it says that is issued pursuant to chapter 14 Let's go to Article 4, Section 1. Section 1. Full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And the Congress may, by general laws, prescribe the manner in which such acts records and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof In this case, body of dogma often faith Christianity Christianity secure belief in God and a trusting acceptance of God's will 
viewed as a theological virtue. Confident or unquestioning belief in the truth, value, or trustworthiness of a person, idea, or thing. See synonyms, synonyms at belief, trust. Right? That's that. Where is faith as far as law is concerned? So see theology, theology. So anytime you're dealing with faith, you're dealing with some theology. You're dealing with some religion. Which is holding the trust. Faith is the obligation of loyalty or fidelity to a person, promise, engagement, etc. The observance of this obligation, fidelity to one's promise, oath, allegiance, etc. In faith, in truth, in deed. Right? Authentication services. Oh. 
authentication services. The Consular Affairs Passport Services support technical operations. Authentications Office provides authentication services to U.S. citizens and foreign nationals on documents that will be used for legal and administrative purposes overseas. Overseas. You know what I mean? Overseas. And what's overseas? Ships is overseas. Scope and policy. The authentications office authenticates a variety of documents from commercial organizations, private citizens, and officials of federal and state governments. Documents include, but are not limited to, company bylaws, powers of attorney, trademark, diplomas, treaties, warrants, extraditions, agreements, certificates of good standing and career letters. B. It will not authenticate documents that are contrary to public policy or are for an improper or unlawful purpose. C. The Authentications Office does not authenticate documents issued abroad by U.S. consular officials such as birth, marriage, or death certificates. Alright, so this deals with authentication services. I want to go here and see the presidential authority of what? Presidential authority to order the removal of the original engrossed Constitution from the Library of Congress. Keep that just because. And let's check it out though. The custody of the original engrossed Constitution of the United States is now vested by statute in the Library of Congress, and no statute authorizes the President to interfere with that custody or to prescribe rules governing it. Therefore, an executive order authorizing the removal of the Constitution from the Library of Congress could neither compel such removal nor make it legal. March 2nd, 1939. Memorandum Opinion for the Attorney General. The Congress undoubtedly has authority to provide by statute for the custody of the Constitution. U.S. Constitution Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. And apparently it has done so. The Continental Congress on March 22nd 1777 created the office of secretary of congress and committed to the incumbent the custody of all journals papers and documents of the congress seven journals of the continental congress 193 dash or 193 to 194. The original engrossed Constitution of the United States was received by the Continental Congress and passed into the custody of its secretary on September 28, 1787. All right. After the Constitution was ratified, the Congress, by Act of July 27, 1789, Chapter 
4, Section 1, 1 Statute 28, created the Department of Foreign Affairs with a secretary for the department. The act of September 15, 1789 changed the name of this department to the Department of State and added to its duties providing in part the said secretary shall forthwith after his appointment be entitled to have the custody and charge of the said seal of the United States and also of all books records and papers remaining in the office of the late secretary of the United States in Congress assembly Chapter 14, Section 7, Section 203 of the Revised Statutes provides The Secretary of State shall have the custody and charge of the seal of the United States and of the seal of the Department of State and of all the books, records, papers, furniture, fixtures, and other property now remaining in and appertaining to the department or hereafter acquired for it. See how this sounds, how it's set up, how things get moved around. Under the above statute constitution or under the above statute the constitution for many years remained in the custody of the Secretary of State. Charles Warren in his work The Making of the Constitution says The original document remained in the possession of the Secretary of Congress, Charles Thompson, until the new government was established. On July 24, 1789, President Washington directed Thompson to deliver the, quote, books, records, and papers of the late Congress, end quote, to Roger Alden, late Deputy Secretary of Congress to take charge of them in New York. The first Congress by Act of September 15, 1789 directed that, quote, all books, records, and papers remaining in the office of the late Secretary of the United States in Congress assembled, end quote, be placed in the charge and custody of the new State Department, right? Alden, however, remained in custody of all these papers until after Thomas Jefferson assumed the duties of the Office of Secretary of State, which he accepted on Fe which he accepted on February 14, 1790, when the government moved from New York to Philadelphia in 1791. The Constitution was taken back to its place of origin and it followed the government and the Secretary of State to Washington in 1800. In 1814 when the British occupied Washington the Declaration of Independence and other papers in the State Department were taken out to Leesburg, Virginia and it is probable that the Constitution was one of these papers. They were returned when President Madison reoccupied Washington. All right. A lot of information in that paragraph right there. A lot of information in this little three-page PDF that I'm definitely going to say. All right. The Act of February 25th, 1903, entitled, quote, An Act Making Appropriations for the Legislative, Executive, and Judicial Expenses of the Government for the Fiscal Year Ending June 30th, 1903. 
1904 and for other purposes end quote, under the heading quote, increase of Library of Congress end quote, provides in part the head of any executive department or bureau or any commission of the government is hereby authorized from time to time to turn over to the Librarian of Congress for the use of the Library of Congress any books maps or other material in the library of the department bureau or commission no longer needed for its use and in the judgment of the librarian of congress appropriate to the uses of the library of congress All right On September 29, 1921, President Harding issued Executive Order 3554, which reads, The original engrossed Declaration of Independence and the original engrossed Constitution of the United States, now in the Department of State, are by authority provided by the Act of Congress entitled, quote, an act making appropriations for the legislative, executive, and judicial expenses of the government for the fiscal year ending June 30, 1904, and for other purposes, end quote, approved February 25, 1903, hereby ordered to be transferred from the Department of State to the custody of the Library of Congress to be there preserved and exhibited under such rules and regulations as may from time to time be prescribed by the Librarian of Congress. This order is issued at the request of the Secretary of State who has no suitable place for the exhibition of these monuments, monuments, monuments. Monuments. Muniment. 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 The evidence, such as documents, that enables one to defend the title to an estate or a claim to rights and privileges, usually used in plural. Archaic, a means of defense. So the muniments was important. Muniment. The muniments. Order is important. This order is issued at the request of the Secretary of State, who has no suitable place for the exhibition of these muniments, and whose building is believed to be not as safe a depository as the Library of Congress. Depository. Depository. something is placed or deposited especially for safekeeping right so you see what's going on here and for the additional reason that it is desired to satisfy the 
laudable wish of patriotic Americans to have an opportunity to see the original fundamental documents upon which rest their independence and their government right it will be noted that the authority contained in the act of February 25th 1903 to transfer documents to the Library of Congress is vested in the heads of the departments and agencies and not in the president executive order 3554 however after citing that act states that it is quote issued at the request of the Secretary of State end quote and I am of the opinion that the transfer of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to the Library of Congress was in fact the act of the Secretary of State in the exercise of the authority conferred upon him by the statute and that while Executive Order 3554 may have lent dignity it added nothing to the legality of the transaction that's a transaction right it thus appears that the custody of the Constitution is now vested by statute in the Library of Congress and I find no statute which authorizes the president to interfere with that custody or to prescribe rules governing it it is my opinion therefore that an executive order authorizing the removal of the Constitution from the Library of Congress could neither compel such removal nor make it legal Golden W. Bell assistant solicitor general right and I'm gonna stop right here little bite-sized pieces about full faith and credit because if I've been given full faith and credit by the Department of State right annexed under the seal of the state of Arizona I need to find out what that means because the other part of this is history our story and genealogy all those events that I was just reading about right my ancestors was here also while they trying to get their documents and get their business up and running right my ancestors already here right so yeah I'm gonna pause it at that point 48 minutes that's that's good enough for dealing with full faith and credit we'll get back to it in another part and start breaking down the different codes and statutes and what exactly full faith and credit means what it means when you authenticate your certificate of live birth what is the certificate of live birth what do these things mean what do these documents mean what is the value of these documents because the only thing that's going on here is business Virginia is a business that was started the Virginia company so we're talking about a business and we're talking about our ancestors already having been here indigenous here you know what I mean already established here 
already doing trade here. So, when they come upon the shores with the British authority, because Washington, D.C. for a time, right? So, you got a war going on right here as they try to lay claim and eke out portions you know I mean of our land so we need to go back and revisit his story and find out where it intersects with our story and start telling that story I ain't gonna hold y'all though